Thank you everyone for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Using Bacteria to Remove Microcystin from Drinking Water. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio's Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision-making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Jason Huntley from the University of Toledo. Dr. Huntley is a professor of microbiology and associate dean of faculty affairs and development at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences where his lab is focused on identifying factors that determine the severity of bacterial infections, examining how the bacteria bind to and invade host cells, and examining immune responses to infection. This includes an interest in using bacterial biofilms to inactivate and degrade algal toxins from drinking water. Dr. Huntley holds degrees from Iowa State University and joined the UT Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology in 2010. We're delighted to have Dr. Huntley here today to discuss his bacteria and microcystin research. Before we get started, a few things about the logistics of the webinar. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during this talk and I'll collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Huntley at the end of his presentation. Just as a reminder, the webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Huntley from the University of Toledo, who will present Using Bacteria to Remove Microcystin from Drinking Water. Dr. Huntley. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, thanks, everyone, for participating today. Um, it's uh, I, I'm really excited to be here, really excited to present here. Uh, I know hopefully you're eating lunch, you can sit back and I won't put you to sleep. Um, so I am gonna be talking today how we're gonna use bacteria, uh, not pathogenic bacteria, but bacteria from Lake Erie to purify water so you can get clean drinking water. And I was looking over the participants today or those that registered. So I'd like to today hopefully provide everyone a brief overview about how did we, how did my lab get here? Um, so I'm gonna present some things that's hardcore science. I'm gonna present some things that, that make sense to everyone, hopefully. Um, so, so I hope you can take something away from, from the story today. So as you heard, I'm at the University of Toledo Medical Center. Um, you know, we have a hospital, we have clinics, uh, we take care of patients. Uh, we also do research to help prevent human diseases and improve human health. Um, so as you heard, my lab normally studies pneumonia. Um, we study bacteria that cause pneumonia. And for years, one thing we've appreciated is that bacteria have to eat, just like you're hopefully doing right now, it's noon, right? Uh, but they don't uh, get to eat cheeseburgers and French fries and other things. Uh, the one thing my lab's been studying is they infect cells, cause disease by stealing amino acids. And uh, let's just keep that in mind, okay? So again, this is what my lab normally does. And then we develop vaccines, therapeutics to help block this process. If you know how bacteria need to steal amino acids from your host cells, then you can develop strategies to block that and starve the bacteria. And then people get healthy. So the Toledo water crisis happened. And again, my lab was studying pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, uh, but, but this really hit home for all of us. And I think what it really did for Toledo and the nation was reveal the fact that there are limitations to water treatment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I love living here in Toledo. We actually have amazing water. And I know the city of Toledo does a great job of delivering millions of gallons of clean drinking water every single day. But 2014 revealed that the current processes, which include flocculation, that's taking particles and coagulating those and removing those, using activated charcoal to remove taste and odors, chlorine to disinfect the water. And then more recently, they've added ozonation to help remove things like microcystin. But 
those do have limitations, including costs. Uh, those of us that live in Toledo know that you know, it does cost money to make those upgrades and prepare for the future. And all these processes, because they do absorb different contaminants in the water, uh, you have to remove the waste products. And that also costs money and also generates uh, hazardous waste that needs to be incinerated or put in special landfills. And I think we can appreciate here the dollar signs. Things do add up. And then ozonation, again, while it's a very powerful tool to remove things like microcystin and other harmful algal bloom toxins, they can generate byproducts like formaldehyde. And I don't think anyone on this call wants formaldehyde in their water, right? Uh, it's great for preserving cadavers here at the School of Medicine, College of Medicine, but you don't want that in your drinking water. So we can take that and also stop and think about the fact that uh, depending on where you are on uh, climate change, and I know some people uh, perhaps don't believe it's real, but one thing you can appreciate is that, and this data is from NOAA, if you look at harmful algal blooms, they occur approximately every other year, right? And I've highlighted with the red stars, 2011, 2013, 2015, about every two years, we have a significant and substantial harmful algal bloom in Lake Erie. Let's look for a minute here. I mean, 2014, the water crisis, this was not the biggest and most toxic harmful algal bloom ever, right? It, it doesn't, you know, we, again, we had a plenty of other years where we had more toxic and larger harmful algal blooms. And here we have the prediction for 2022, and it's a bit early, but if you've looked at the harmful algal bloom bulletin from NOAA, uh, we have rec above recreational limits of microcystin toxin in the water right now uh, by Monroe and kind of in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. So let, let's see what happens this year. And then of course, who, who knows what's gonna happen next year, the year after that. Um, uh, again, we just don't know what's gonna happen. 2014, the harmful algal bloom just happened to sit over our intake crib here for the city of Toledo. But what if we had a bloom like 2015 or 2011 that sits over the water intake crib next year or the year after that, are we prepared? And Let's take even a further step back. This isn't just a Toledo or Lake Erie problem. Harmful algal blooms occur worldwide. And focus just here on the green colors. This is places where number one, blooms are detected in fresh water. And number two, they release enough toxin to be detected. Um, and we're talking about uh, above the, the drinking limit, which is one part per billion. So this is a worldwide problem. And this is, again, one reason why my lab is studying this, to help protect human health worldwide. And this just highlights again, you know, here closer, not Toledo, but here's San Francisco. They have major harmful algal blooms in East Bay. Uh, we see uh, kills of animals, including uh, livestock, such as pigs and, and cattle in France. They have harmful algal blooms in Lake Taihu near Qingdao, China, uh, even in Australia, right? This is not just a Toledo problem. So this is the toxin, right? Microcystin or MCLR uh, that causes liver cancer. Uh, you've heard about that. It causes gastrointestinal problems, uh, diarrhea, things associated with um, uh, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease. It can cause neurological problems, skin lesions. It can cause asthma-like symptoms. Microcystin does a lot of things. And of course, what we're most concerned about is if you ingest it, uh, it can induce liver cancer. But I told you before that my lab studies bacteria and how they steal amino acids from the host. And so what really got us interested is when 2014 happened and thinking about the problem, uh, when I looked at the toxin, if you look at this, and I've highlighted here in this diagram, um, the toxin is essentially seven amino acids, right? Glutamic acid, alanine, leucine, if any of you take multivitamins, you may notice some of these in your multivitamin. And I've told you before that bacteria need to eat just like we do. And if you're a bacteria in Lake Erie, and if, you know, as I showed you, harmful algal blooms have been occurring and reoccurring for years, isn't it possible that through evolution, there are naturally occurring bacteria in Lake Erie that use this molecule, microcystin, as an energy source? I mean, why not, right? If you're trying to grab energy from somewhere and you're a bacteria close to the harmful algal bloom, wouldn't you evolve to use this toxin as energy? So let's put everything together I've kind of set the stage for. Harmful algal blooms are not going away. Some years are worse than others and we don't know what the future is. Harmful algal blooms are cyanobacteria. They're photosynthesizing bacteria uh, that produce this molecule I showed you, a toxin, which is basically seven amino acids. 
And I also told you that my lab for years has been studying how pathogenic bacteria cause lung infections, cause pneumonia. But one thing we haven't talked about so far is that uh, although we've painted the picture of bacteria being bad, right, with harmful algal blooms and human diseases, let's remember for a second that bacteria can also do some really important beneficial things. We use them for cheese, uh, beer, wine, yogurt. Um, some of you on this call today may take culturel or a probiotic to help with intestinal health. Uh, perhaps some of you on this call are diabetics. Uh, you may know that the insulin that you take is generated from bacteria, right? The medical and pharmaceutical industry use bacteria for all kinds of beneficial uh, drugs and therapeutics. And then most importantly, uh, some of you may know that we use bacteria for, for bioremediation. We use bacteria to clean up oil spills, to remove arsenic, to degrade plastics, to make jet fuel or bio I mean, we, we use bacteria for all kinds of things. So my lab asked the question, you know, couldn't we isolate bacteria from Lake Erie that have evolved and then use those to degrade microcysts and, and purify clean drinking water? And we do this through what we call biofilters. And, and I'll get to that in a second, but it's using bacteria in filters that already exist to degrade that toxin from the water. So uh, full disclosure, right? Uh, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Uh, I don't claim to have invented this idea, uh, but one thing my lab is, is we're persistent and we're stubborn. So we stick with problems and we're continuing to stick with this. So we did find, I mean, there's papers from Australia in 1996 where the Australians isolated a bacteria uh, from a harmful algal bloom river, and they found that it degraded microcystin LR. The Chinese had done the same thing. This is from 2010. You can find papers from Brazil, other countries, but the one stark contrast is that to our knowledge, there's no use of bacteria right now in water filtration, right? Or, or those enzymes. So, so obviously there's some gaps or there's some hurdles that have to be overcome. So how did we set about doing this? I mean, we've gone into Lake Erie through help of collaborators, including University of Toledo, the Lake Erie Center here at the University of Toledo. And I've indicated on this map, we've gotten samples from all over Lake Erie from 2014, including we're getting them this year. And we take those in the lab and what we do is we pre-filter those. So you can imagine like a cheesecloth, we remove most of the large particulates. And then we add these to flasks. Yes, I'm gonna get to a little bit of science here. And then we just feed those bacteria microcystin toxin. Two or three times a week, we add it. The point is, again, thinking about Darwin and selection of the fittest evolution. If those bacteria really are present and the only thing we give them is microcystin uh, day after day, we will select for or enrich for the bacteria that can degrade the toxin. And the rest of the bacteria or microbes in that flask will die off because they run out of food. Uh, so then I'm, I'm representing here, if that's one of these bacteria in red, it's lowly, it's not very abundant at the beginning, but over days and weeks, it becomes more and more abundant because it can eat the microcystin, the toxin in the uh, sample. We can then quantitate that. We have ways of uh, counting the number of toxin molecules. And we should end up with bacteria that degrade toxin. And then we can, again, use this for water filtration or identify the enzymes. And, and I'll talk about that towards the end. Uh, it's a very efficient mechanism of cleaving and eliminating that toxin. So here's generally how we do our experiments. So some of you are thinking, who, who is this guy? Uh, or how should I believe him? Why should I believe him? Let me just walk you through some basic microbiology. Let me take you back to college here. If you take a harmful algal bloom sample and you plate it on media, on auger plates that'll support lake bacteria, this is what you see. And again, you don't have to be a microbiologist to appreciate there's maybe three to five different types of bacteria on this plate. But if our selection, our enrichment, if the Darwin evolution really happens, if we only add microcystin every single day and they can eat it and increase in numbers and the other bacteria and, and uh, microbes can't eat, they should decrease in numbers. And we should, we should see a shift in the population. And then let me show you right here, three weeks later after adding microcystin, Again, you don't have to be a microbiologist. You don't have to look under a microscope. You can clearly see the bacteria changed, right? We see pink, we see orange, we see yellow, uh, tan colored. The shape has changed. Some of you could say, well, maybe microcystin mutated the bacteria. Yeah, that, that's possible. Um, 
If so, they would grow much slower, right? So we actually checked then a second way to ask, did the bacterial increase in numbers over time? Again, if they're eating, they should start replicating and increasing. If they can't eat, they're gonna die. So we looked at the bacterial numbers, they actually increase over time. And you can see that here, week one, week two, week three, these are different samples we've taken. You know, some kind of grow rapidly and stall, other ones continue growing, but growth is our second indicator that degradation is actually occurring. Now, our third way to check if there's enrichment or we're selecting for microcyst degrading bacteria, we actually counted the number of toxin molecules in each sample. And I'm showing you a lot of data here, but let's just look at this 7M sample. The blue arrow indicates when we add microcyst into the sample, right? It's about 35 parts per billion. That's 35 times more toxic than we should ever encounter as humans. Three or four days later, it goes down to about 15. We add microcyst in again, it goes up, our bacteria degraded. We add it, bacteria degraded. So, I mean, here's a sample that does a really good job of degrading. To show you that these samples are in, in fact different, I mean, here's a sample that it, a GR1, it takes three or four days, nothing happens. We add and it starts degrading. Um, anyway, you can see various levels of degrading or not, these samples are truly different. But I'm only showing you about 20, 21 days of degradation. We asked more important questions about, you know, could we get different groups of bacteria and show degradation over extended periods of time? That's what I'm showing you here. We got a sample from Justin Chaffin right outside of the Stone Lab. Uh, those of you who are Ohio State fans should appreciate this. Um, this sample, here I'm showing you a negative control. So this is, we take a harmful algal bloom sample, we sterile filter it, we remove all the bacteria out of it, and we only add microcystin to ask how stable the toxin is in just lake water. And you can see the concentration keeps increasing over the experiment. There's a little bit of variation that happens with, with lab studies, right? But look at the degradation in this sample. After a few days of kind of adjustment, you can see here on day five, we add microcystin, it goes down. We add microcystin, it goes down. We did this eight different times over the process of a month. And the toxin kept getting degraded to almost zero. I mean, if you add this up, we put 616 parts per billion in both samples and the bacterial sample degraded 19 parts per billion per day. Again, let's go back to 2014 and the water crisis. There was about one to two parts per billion in the water and one part per billion is toxic to humans. Our bacteria can remove 19 parts per billion per day. Imagine if we could have added that to the Toledo water treatment plant, um, you know, potentially we, we wouldn't have had a water crisis. So where are we going with this? I mean, um, the thing is, I'm not going to show you all the data because it gets very scientific, but we've been doing a lot of genome sequencing, identifying the gene, genome and uh, genus and species. Uh, we want to make sure we aren't replicating the same bacteria over and over again. So far, we've isolated and identified 66 different bacteria that in groups, right, groups of 10, 20, whatever, degrade microcystin. And we're more interested after talking with uh, different government regulators, Ohio EPA, Ohio Department of Public Health, federal regulators about what would we need to do to possibly use this for water filtration. And they've all said, reduce the complexity, have it as simple as possible. So I'm gonna show you some data from recently. We've been now showing degradation from groups of five bacteria or individual. And I hope you can appreciate here is, this is a group we call group N, it's five bacteria put together Again, the blue arrows indicate when we add the toxin. Three or four days later, it goes to zero. We add the toxin, it goes to zero. And in the gray is the negative control, right? This is just lake water that's sterile filtered. There's no bacteria in it. You can see the concentration keeps going up. Again, if you calculate the difference here, our bacteria degrade four part per billion per day. Again, that would more than fix the Toledo water crisis of 2014. So these are very efficient, very effective at degrading microcystin. I mean, thinking more globally, uh, we have MCLR, um, and I won't go through the biochemistry. Uh, if some of you have questions, we can go through it, but um, there's over 200 different flavors, versions, or what we call congeners of microcystin. MCLR is the most dominant in Lake Erie. But for instance, I showed you that picture of San Francisco Bay. Uh, they have MCRR in California. Their cyanobacteria produce this. In Florida, in Lake Okeechobee, their cyanobacteria produce MCLA, which is shown here, and I've highlighted the variable amino acid positions. So we asked the question, 
could we use our bacteria more globally? Or, you know, focusing here on the US, could we use these to treat harmful algal blooms in California, Florida, other places? And the simpler answer is this. I mean, I've shown you the same type of graph. Again, the negative control is in gray. The toxin concentration keeps going up because we keep adding it. And in our samples with bacteria, with that group N again, we add it, it goes down. We add it, it goes down. You know, two to three parts per billion per day, our bacteria can degrade, no problem. I mean, this is MCLA. It's, again, the data is maybe not as clean as we would like, but the average degradation is still pretty strong. So some of you are asking, what is this Huntley guy talking about? Um, I'm not sure if I want bacteria in my water or how could this even be used? So let me kind of give you an overview of how Toledo and other cities purify their drinking water. So here in Toledo, you know, we have the intake crib. It intakes water from Lake Erie and pumps it. Then it goes through a series of kind of uh, coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation steps. Again, that's to take the large particles out of the water and remove those. Then that lake water is passed through a sand filter. And that's shown here in the red box. Um, this is what step we think we could add our bacteria to these sand filters and then use it to purify water. And here's the important thing, please remember that. Um, after the sand filter step, it's disinfected with chlorine. So any bacteria that might get through, and again, uh, the sand filters that the Toledo treatment plan uses are not sterile. I'll show you here in a second. So any bacteria that might get through are disinfected with chlorine before being pumped out to your house. So this is the general process. We think we would add our bacteria here to the sand filters. I mean, we've been talking with the city of Toledo for five or six years since we started this project, making sure what we're doing is practical. Thinking about the lab experiments we do, is it, uh, relevant to what the city of Toledo does. And here's actually one of the sand filters they use. Again, millions of gallons of water go through sand filters every day in Toledo. Water's pumped in here, and then it's gravity fed through six, eight feet of sand, and magically the water gets purified. It's not magic. As I told you, these are not sterile. There's viruses, bacteria, fungi that live in the sand and help remove contaminants, taste, odor compounds from the water. So this is where we envision adding our bacteria. So could it actually work? So we've done some experiments. This is what we call our biofilter. So this is you know, a, a filter here. We, this is sand, just like what Toledo uses, just like people use in their, in their pools to purify their swimming pools. Uh, we take this sand and we either have negative controls or sand filters without our bacteria. Or here in blue, we have two different filters with our bacteria. This is just for what we call reproducibility. We want to make sure we're not generating random data, but it's reproducible. Well, you can see here in black and gray, the sand filters without our bacteria, they do not bind microcystin. They do not degrade it. You can see that the microcystin levels remain very constant over five days, right? I'm showing you that here in hours, but this is five days. In contrast, look at in blue. Our sand filters, we turn on the pump and we start running contaminated water with microcystin through it. It can see very quickly, right? One part per billion per hour. Our bacteria are degrading microcystin and removing it from the water. And then the water we collect from the very bottom here has almost undetectable levels of microcystin. I mean, listen, I wanna be clear. Uh, if you look at the concentration here, we're adding about 20 parts per billion of microcystin. That's 20 times more than the EPA limit. So, I mean, we're really pushing hard on these trials to show how uh, efficacious our bacteria are. And I mean, I've calculated here in the bottom, right? One part per billion, 1.3 part per billion, that's per hour, right? So we really think these studies show in a filter where we're running water constantly through these filters for five days, our bacteria do an amazing job of removing uh, microcystin toxin from the water. So, so what have we been up to um, since some of these studies? Um, as I told you, we're really excited by the biofilter studies. We're now trying to scale these up. Again, we want everything we do to be relevant to what the city of Toledo does and make sure what we do can be applied to real world applications. So scaling these up into gallons of water and seeing if our bacteria can remove toxin from the water. Part of that also includes, as a, in terms of scalability, um, looking at flow rates, how quickly we can set up our filters. Um, 
you know, instead of this taking weeks, could we add our bacteria to a filter in a matter of hours, get them to bind to the sand and then quickly degrade water? Um, what if we add microcystin to the water and take it away? You know, can, it, can they um, degrade? And then maybe if there's no toxin in the water for a week, can they start to degrade again a week later? We're asking all kinds of questions about utility. And then again, as I showed you, and you know, perhaps I alluded to, we, we understand some people may be nervous about us adding bacteria. To be clear, right, uh, these are not genetically engineered. We didn't modify them. They're naturally occurring in Lake, in Lake Erie. All we're trying to do is ask questions about if we could add them to the sand filters. But we acknowledge, what if some of our bacteria made it out of the sand filter? And I showed you that next step is chlorination. What if some of them weren't killed by chlorine, right? Are they safe for humans? So we've been doing safety studies in, in mice. And again, you know, we're medical school, we're interested in human health. Uh, we have a um, lot of different programs. So, so we're set up to do these experiments. So let me just show you briefly. I mean, we, we do this again, because we study bacterial pneumonia. Uh, we were working on COVID. Um, anyway, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Um, my PhD is actually in pathology. So I'm I'm trained in studying death and disease, right? Um, so one thing we do is we can look at animals and have health status scales. We assessed our bacteria in two different mice. Valve C are just normal laboratory mice. And then these skid mice are what we call severely immunocompromised. These have to be maintained under very special conditions. Otherwise they get sick and die from anything. So what we're asking is if we give these mice our bacteria in their drinking water, they get it as much as they want. Do they get sick? Do they get diarrhea? Do they change behavior? Um, anything. I, what you can appreciate here is having, you know, when we look at these twice per day for up to a month, uh, 10 to the third is 1,000 bacteria, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000. Those mice continually got our bacteria for a month. There was no diarrhea, no signs of disease. We then looked at these, uh, you know, in the human world, we call it autopsies, and animal world, we call it necropsies. We looked at their stomachs, at their intestines, at their livers, spleens, kidneys, you name it. There was no sign of infection, no sign of disease. As far as we can tell, these bacteria are completely safe uh, in mammals. Um, and you know, studies will be ongoing to see if they're safe in humans. And again, what's the practicality of that? Um, we've also then, those same mice, uh, we've been testing those as probiotics. You know, I showed you that picture of Culturel before. We've been asking questions about could we give our bacteria like a yogurt or in drinking water? And then uh, we give those mice toxin, just like the 2014 water event. And we ask questions about whether or not the mice got sick. In fact, in the studies, and I'm not going to show you today, but uh, they did not show signs of liver toxicity, no liver cancer. In fact, we detect the toxin in the urine, indicating that our bacteria help shuttle the toxin out of the intestine right to the kidneys, and the mice peed it out. So we have really good data right now that our bacteria could be used as a probiotic to prevent and block toxin absorption. And then the final thing we're doing is trying to identify the enzymes. Um, you know, that is what chews up the toxin, breaks it up into smaller parts. And for the scientists in the audience, we're doing that by RNA sequencing. We're trying to identify what genes are turned on in the presence of microcystin as an indicator of the genes make enzymes. What enzymes could we purify to degrade the enzyme? And that's shown here. And the reason we're studying that is enzymes are much more stable, much more efficient than adding bacteria to biofilters or taking probiotics. And for those of you who like to go camping, you can appreciate, you can buy tablets or water droplets that you add to water that you think is contaminated. It removes fungi, bacteria, viruses, different contaminants. So why not include our enzymes? Imagine you're on a boat in Lake Erie, imagine you have a cabin and you're worried about um, contamination. Or for developing countries, again, if there's a large harmful algal bloom event, and that's where people get water, then if you could just add the droplet and the water's purified. So, so that's where we're going with all these projects. And again, you know, we're at a medical center. Our focus is definitely on human health, um, but our focus is also practical applications to make clean drinking water. So I couldn't do any of this work. Uh, it, it's not me, right? I actually have an amazing team of people who work incredibly hard. Uh, Allison T started this project. She now lives in Colorado. Alex McCartney uh, was a bioinformatic. He was a student here. He did a lot of the sequencing work to try to, try to identify genus and species. What are these bacteria? 
Are they related to human pathogens? He showed which ones were not, and that's the ones we're following up on. Upasana is the new student in the lab, and she's continuing all these projects. We've had amazing medical students, masters of public health students, undergraduate students. Um, I'm so thankful to have a great team. We're currently funded by NOAA. I'm so thankful for NOAA funding to continue these projects. Previous funding from Ohio Sea Grant, uh, and the Ohio Department of Higher Education, and then great collaborators from Ohio State here at the University of Toledo, Bowling Green, and Wayne State. So I hope I haven't given you too much uh, data. I hope I balanced the uh, kind of 20,000 foot view and hardcore data. Um, so really thanks everybody for attending. I hope you learned something. I hope you can appreciate there are some good bacteria in the world and we're trying to use those to purify water. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Huntley. Um, well, we've gotten quite a few great questions uh, during uh, Dr. Huntley's presentation. And we're, I'm gonna ask as many as I can what questions we can't get to. Uh, Dr. Huntley said he would answer and we'll post on the website for uh, for you all to, to look at. We actually have um, a lot of the questions you already answered, oh. Dr. Huntley. <laughs> There's quite a few that you have already answered. So let me, let me, but we did have quite a few that were asking about um, specifically um, uh, the water treatment process and, and how these bacteria would, would be in that role. Um, one of the questions um, was, um, well, here was, this was a clarifying question. I think you had I think you had answered this, but I just want to double check. Um, does the bacteria work as efficiently with the lower concentration of microcystin that is more similar to what we do see in Lake Erie? That, uh, that's a great question. Um, you'll see most of the numbers we add were usually in the what we call the recreational range. So we're probably 15 to 20 parts per billion. We have not specifically tested one or two parts per billion. Um, we, we should do that, but, uh, sometimes again, just experimental variability, um, we do by accident add five, four parts per billion and, and our bacteria have no problem. I mean, again, in those situations, as quick as we add it, it's gone. Um, so we don't have any reason to believe they have no problem with lower concentrations, but, um, you actually bring up a good point, which is what I tried to allude to before. Um, imagine if we had a biofilter, right? And uh, there was a big release of toxin, we're confident our bacteria could chew it up. But then what if there were like six, seven, eight days, I don't know, maybe two weeks where there was no toxin? We, we do have concerns that our bacteria could survive. We've tested that in the lab where we've, in those biofilter studies I showed you, we run contaminated water through it and they degrade it. Then we took contaminated water away for two weeks. Then we, added contaminated water again, and they still degraded toxin. So again, we have every indication they can turn on and off those enzymes and they don't need to only live on microsystem. Okay, thank you. Um, a question that we had was, um, would you see this as an additional tool in the water treatment process with the current processes still in place or would it replace any part of the current process that works for harmful algal blooms? Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have any aspirations that our bacteria alone could be used. Again, we see these as a supplement to existing um, processes. Um, you know, as we really start to scale up and think about flow rates, pressure, um, you know, it could be that our bacteria have certain limitations. So we're just trying to add something. Uh, and in case somebody is interested in, well, how much would it cost? Um, I'm sorry if I didn't like, specifically say, we literally grow our bacteria in lake water. We take lake water, we sterile filter it. So the only cost is us getting lake water in buckets or, you know, thinking long-term some big bio fermenter to grow these up. But the this isn't specialized media. They literally grow in lake water. And would you say that there would be, um, would there be training that we had a question dealing with the cost and then also if there would be training that would be involved uh, to incorporate that in into a treatment process? Um, yeah, that, that's another great question. We're, we're, we're not quite sure about the training part right now. I mean, they, they seem really stable. Again, they just grow in lake water. Uh, 
maybe a better way to answer this question is um, we ourselves probably cannot grow up enough bacteria to let's say populate the filters at, at the city of Toledo. But um, so thinking long-term, there'd have to be some kind of, uh, you know, biotechnology company that would grow these to such a scale, right? I mean, you would need like a milk truck full of bacteria to colonize all the water filters. And so there, there would be special equipment, some special training needed to grow that much bacteria and, and to do, you know, some safety testing that's needed for those types of studies. Okay. Um, another question that we had, and of course now we're getting like all these questions. So I'm going to only do about like three more questions and then just save the rest. If again, if you don't mind uh, answering some a little bit later. Um, what if um, a treatment plant doesn't use sand filters anymore? What if they're using graduated activated carbon? And so here's the question of if the microorganisms need to be fed the microcystin amino acids, how do they eat during the six to eight months when microcystin isn't present? Yep, that's also a good point. Um, yeah, so the the activated charcoal or GAC, um, you, you're right. We haven't done those studies. Uh, there would be some concerns about our bacteria. The beauty about GAC, the activated charcoal, is that it has all these pores, right? And think of like about it like a big sponge, and it does soak up a number of things. So there would be concerns about our bacteria, but anything in the lake uh, plugging up all those holes. Um, then the second part of that question, what would happen during the six to eight months in the winter when there's no microcystin? You, uh, again, we haven't tested that long-term. I told you we tested our biofilters and took the water without microcystin away for two weeks. I don't know about six or eight months. Being practical, we would probably have to add our bacteria to whatever filter, probably this time, right? July every year, um, June, July, just to prepare for a uh, a pending harmful algal bloom. All right. Um, and one question that we had was, is there a, is there a byproduct of the degradation of the microcystin that could have potentially a larger ecological consequence, like nutrient loading, for instance? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I didn't want to get into that data today, but we have taken samples from our, um, again, we have these cultures, we add microcystin, we measure concentrations. We also subject these samples to what's called mass spectrometry analysis. So that molecule I showed you with the amino acids, it's, it's in a cyclic structure. We've analyzed that by mass spectrometry. We see that our bacteria break it down to a linear form. It, it makes it linear. That's well known to be 120 times less toxic than the cyclic. Uh, we detect that. And then we also detect that our bacteria further break that linear product down into what's called a tetrapeptide, um, which is uh, also less toxic than the cyclic. So um, we've, again, I didn't have time to go through all that. This would have been hardcore mass spectrometry and biochemical analysis. I, I didn't want you to all fall asleep. We, we have that data and that's part of that safety study we're doing. I told you about the mice uh, and proving that they don't get sick. We also are looking at the breakdown products to make sure that what's being generated is not potentially harmful or toxic. Okay. Um, here's the last question. Um, what, I, where, where do you go from here? We've got a couple of questions that people are asking of like, what's your time frame? When is this going to be able to be incorporated <laughs> into a treatment plant? Like what is the next step for you? That's a tough question. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, and, and I go to national conferences and we have people here at the University of Toledo that dedicate their whole lives to trying to just answer one question. Um, I, again, I'm really proud of my team because I think we've made a lot of progress in five to six years. Um, where are we really going with this? Uh, again, we're trying to generate enough uh, efficacy. We're trying to generate enough data to show that our bacteria work that they're safe to use. And if we can work on biofilters, that, that's fantastic. I also understand uh, that some regulatory agencies and, and the public may not like the theory of adding bacteria to water. So that's why we're looking at the enzymes. Uh, again, if we can isolate or uh, produce 
And that would also re require special training and a, a biopharma company to do this. But again, if you can make insulin, if you can do any, you know, Novavax, it's a recombinant protein vaccine against COVID. It's easy then, right? Everything's set up to make recombinant enzyme. So you can literally just add a droplet for water treatment, whether it's at a city scale or in your boat or in your cabin or while you're hiking. So that's really, again, where we're going. Very applied applications to either use our bacteria or isolate enzymes that you can add to water and chew up the toxin. All right, well, thank you. Uh, what I will do is collect all the rest of the other questions, get those to Dr. Huntley, and we'll uh, give him some time to answer those and get those onto our website here so all of you can see those answers. Uh, I wanted to close with thanking you again, Dr. Huntley. This was a great presentation and thank you for your willingness to talk with us today about your research. It was really an excellent discussion and a big thank you too to Christina for uh, her work organizing this webinar. Um, I just would like to remind everyone that the survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Mike McKay, who will be talking about his research dealing with algae in the winter. The uh, registration link is in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Huntley. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you again, Dr. Huntley. Oh, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.